Um, so let me see, where are we? Uh, blah, 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 blah. We're here, right here, right? Okay, so here's the way this is going to work. Um, we have class today, that's that one, and then we have class tomorrow as well. I thought we didn't have class, I canceled some Friday class, but I guess it's not this one. Um, and then, let's see, then this is next week. Oh, there's no Friday class next week. There used to be a Friday class next week, but there's not now. And then there used to be class on this day, but I'm, I have to fly somewhere, so we can't have class that day either. Okay? Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. Okay? I'm just mentioning that um, there'll be no class that day, and there'll be no class the Friday before that, which is what, the 24th? Which we're on there before. So you, I'm sure you're not going to complain, right? All right. If we look at the schedule here, you'll see that um, by the end of this week, you should have looked at the homework that we have posted, the written homework. And then you can also see this is a week from today, right? Is that right? A week from today, you're supposed to do this project selection thing. That probably snuck up on you a tad. Okay. So I'll have to look. I don't remember how many people I said you could work with. Was it groups of four? It's either three or four, but I think it was four. So it works just like 361, okay? You're supposed to send me some idea of something you want to do. I mean, a logical thing is you want to do some control problem in Simulink, right? And the, it'll largely consist, and since you, you're probably going to do something like PID control, you'll have more machinery developed to do that as we move along. Um, and so the key thing will be picking some process that you want to control, okay? And you can... In principle, think about the things that you might have worked on last semester. Because last semester, you, most people basically solved a model, right? You could think about using the same model for control. I can help you um, develop some ideas as long as you have some ideas to begin with. Like, I don't like the ones where people come and say, I don't know what to do. <laughs> okay. So you might say, well, I thought about doing this problem, but I really don't know what I should control. You know, but something that indicates you've thought about it. And so again, it'll be groups of four. And the, the, just the selection parts were 20% of the total amount. And the, the project itself is not a minimum, it's like 10% or something like that of the total. Grant. So you, you should select the project and do it on time. So you have to start thinking about this. Selecting means you send me an email and I either, I send you at some point either an email back that says that sounds good or, I, or, I, or you come talk to me and I tell you it's good. Something that indicates, and I'll keep track of it, that I've approved what you're going to do. I don't make sure it's not too trivial, but I also want to make sure it's not too hard. And, and it might be a little bit hard for you guys at this point to know what you're getting into. So I could help you make sure that you're not biting off more than you can chew. And then you'll see that the actual project itself is, is the last day of class. Okay. So the project is meant to be something that you do on the computer. You know, it's a MATLAB simulant kind of thing. So I'm not interested in problems where you're going to like do it on a piece of paper. We do a lot of that. Okay? So anyway, you've got to start, start thinking about that. And um, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Okay. So you have any questions about the project thing? It's, it's, li it's a lot like 361. Okay. Same idea. All right. All right. Today we're going to cover an important topic um, that has to do with control. So um, let me... Let me see, do I have my famous picture here? That figures. Okay. Um, let me pull up something here real quick. You got, this guy has his own conversation going on over here. <laughs> oh, that's all right. It's all right. Nothing like getting called out in front of the class, so they usually calm you down. All right. Um, Okay, so here is what I'm referring to, at least I hope so. Okay, this. This picture here, okay? So what we did last time was the following. So this is our typical closed-loop block diagram, right? We have a controller and a final control element, usually a valve, a process that we want to control. We have a disturbance transfer function. So the disturbance goes through this transfer function. The manipulated input goes through this one. They add up and give you the output. You have to measure that compared to the set point operate on it with the controller, send a signal to the valve. 
Um, and last time what we did was we looked at closed loop responses. So I gave you all these different transfer functions and then we use relationships like this to compute the response, right? I give you everything here and then I give you a certain set point change like a step change m over s and then we try to compute the response y of t, right? And in case you don't remember what this involved, uh, oh, this is, this is, um, yeah, it's not the same. It's not the lecture I thought it was. But um, this got pretty hairy at times, right? So if these, if these expressions were complicated and when you form this thing, it could get pretty unwieldy. And um, it wasn't all that much fun sometimes. So the question uh, we're trying to ask now is we don't actually want to compute the response, okay? What the question I want to ask is how do we know when this thing is, the system is stable, okay? So by stable, I mean the output doesn't, like go off. Here's an example, here's example of us, the kind of instabilities we're interested in. So here's the output versus time. If we see something like this, right, we don't like that. That arrow means it's just going off to infinity. Or that's one kind of, that's an exponential kind of instability. Or you could have an instability where the system oscillates, but the oscillations grow, okay? These, this is bad, okay? So the minimal requirement we have for a controller is it's stable. Right? It still could be really bad. It doesn't mean it performs well, but stability is obviously um, unacceptable performance. So we want to try to understand what's the effect of this controller on the stability of this thing. Now, you could imagine here that, well, one of the great things about control that I'll teach you is that if the process itself is unstable, okay, actually you kind of did this. You remember when you did the uh, bioreactor problem, you had two cell types that were growing from a single um, substrate and you wanted them to coexist with each other. You wanted them both to have non-zero concentrations. That steady state is unstable. And the only way you can get the system to operate at that steady state is to do feedback control. So at the end of that exercise, that was the first MATLAB homework, I had you, even though you didn't probably know what you were doing, connect up a controller and showed you could operate the system at this, um, that was basically an unstable steady state. Okay. So that's one of the great things about control. You can, make a, you can take a system that is unstable and make it stable with feedback. So that's, that's great. Otherwise, you couldn't operate many of the, you couldn't operate chemical reactors, for example. You couldn't operate anything at an unstable steady state. So that's good, okay? But one of the bad things that could happen, you could take a process that's otherwise stable and make it unstable by feedback. That's not so good, right? So in other words, the process is inherently stable, but you do a really bad design of this controller, and now you do this, now the system's unstable. So you put like a set point change in the output, does this, okay? We want to preclude that possibility, okay? So what we're trying to do in this particular lecture that I'm about to cover is try to determine how we can design this controller so the system's at least stable, okay? The closed loop system is stable. So the way to think about this is, Everything in this block diagram is specified except for this. And we want to make sure that we design this controller such that the system will be stable. Okay? So we're not actually trying to compute the response. We're doing something actually is less, just making sure it's um, actually stable. Okay? So to do this, I'll start off with an example um, just to motivate why, the, well, the problem that we're dealing with here. I'll give some general result. The, this general result is true, but it's hard to test, okay? So then I'm gonna proceed to give you two tests that are easy to implement. The thing is, we wanna determine if the system is stable without computing the response, which is what the point I'll make up here, okay? Then in the end, I'll go over a little example in Simulink. Okay, so here's a little toy example. Let's say I give you this. So here is some transfer functions. So what I'm gonna do is use them here, right? This is the closed loop transfer function for set point changes. So I'm, I'm specifying what all these things are up here, except for the controller. At this point, I'm just going to tell you the controller is a proportional controller, but I'm not telling you what KC is, okay? There's the process transfer function. Disturbance transfer function doesn't even matter here because um, it's not in this thing. There's the valve. There's the measurement device. You plug all that stuff in here, okay, including this thing, which I assume is a unit step change 1 over S, which is where that comes from. Simplify, you get this. Just a matter of plugging simplifying, okay? E everyone could do that, I hope, okay? All right, so you get this thing. And now you, the question you want to ask yourself, for what values of Kc is this stable, okay? Um, so here's what you don't want to do. Well, here's, here's what, <laughs> I'll show you on the next slide what you don't want to do. 
But you see KC appears here, right, in the numerator, also appears in the denominator. I'm about to show you the key thing is the denominator here. You, you hopefully remember that when we were talking about open loop systems, right, we had the controlled output, we had the manipulated input, we had a process transfer function that at that point we just called G of S, but now we're calling G of P typically. And it was some numerator polynomial in S over denominator polynomial in S. Maybe a time delay, doesn't, that doesn't make any difference. And we found the key thing here was to take, right, check the roots of the denominator. Those were called the poles. And if we found out, if we plotted those poles in this complex plane, so this is that real axis, this is the imaginary, because right, the roots of this equation is a polynomial, might have real and um, imaginary parts, might be complex numbers. We found that as long as they had negative real part, the system was stable, right? So I guess I'll write it up here. This half of the complex plane was stable, and this half was unstable, OK? So to do this test, you had to basically have the transfer function, have this denominator polynomial, factor it, and check, check the roots of that polynomial. OK. So we're going to find out the same thing applies here. But the complication is you see this, this denominator now depends on KC. Right? So it's, it's not clear how you factor it and find the roots. OK. One thing you could do is take this, like the exa what I'm going to show in the next slide, take this thing into Simulink, right? Simulate. You know, hopefully you know how to simulate this. You would go into Simulink. You would make a block diagram that looks just like that one up there, OK? Right? You would call this guy KC. You don't, you'd have to choose a value. You'd, call, you know, you'd plug all these things in, doing the Simulink block diagram simulation. You'd pick a value of KC, simulate the response. If it was stable, you like that value of KC. And then you pick another value of KC, if, you, if it's so on and so forth. Um, not very efficient. Um, and if you do that, you would get, not that, because that's the wrong lecture. You would get something that looks like this. Okay? So this is a simulation that shows the output versus time. And what's done here is you're simulating this transfer, f this, this uh, closed loop system, just like I showed you, you would do in a block diagram. And you're doing it for different values of KC. Okay? So, because we're doing a set point change at time 0, the set point's going from 0 to 1 because it's a unit step change. And we want the output to go from 0 to 1. De every, everything's a deviation variable as usual. Okay? And then we see what we get depends strongly on the value of Kc. So if Kc is 2, well, the response isn't too good, but it's stable. right? I mean, if you look at this thing, you can see it's going to go to some steady state eventually. If it's 6, it's starting to oscillate, but the oscillations are decaying. And then if it's 15, it's oscillating, and now the oscillations are growing. Okay, so you can imagine somewhere in here between 6 and 15 some critical value, right? If it's greater than that value, it's unstable. If it's less than that value, it's stable. Th this isn't the way you want to try to find the value, right? So once you realize this, you could try 9 and then 12 and then you'd find the 9.1 and 9.2. <laughs> and eventually you could hone in on this value. That's a really inefficient way to do it, okay? So what I'm going to try to do is show you, well, I will show you, more efficient ways to find out whether this is the case, okay? The idea here is that if you want to tune a controller, let's say you found the critical value here is 12.6, which I think it is. I'll show you later. That means values above 12.6 are not allowed. They, they're unstable. The system won't be stable for those values. So you can limit your search of good values to things below that. Okay? So the way to think about stability is it's a necessary condition for the system to behave well. It's not sufficient. You know what I mean by necessary? If it's not stable, you're screwed. That's not technical, but anyway. Um, if it is stable, the performance can still be pretty bad. Like, I wouldn't call this a good, good performance right there. Like, you know, it's really slow. It's oscillatory. It's not going to get to the set point because it doesn't have integral action, blah, blah, blah. But at least it's stable. It's a, it's a minimal requirement we're talking about. OK. So in terms of stability, it's a pretty simple concept if the system is linear. If the system is nonlinear, talking about stability is more complicated, but we're not going to do that. So this is, this is pretty simple definition here. So if you have a linear system, it, it's stable, right? If you put in some bounded input and something bounded comes out, OK? So what, what's a bounded input? A step change, a pulse, uh, um, a rectangular pulse, an impulse, OK? What's not a, a bounded input? A ramp, right? You can't expect to put a ramp in a system and, and it reaches steady state. It's not reasonable, right? 
So the idea here is you put a bounded input out, something comes out that's bounded. So we're usually interested in step changes. So the idea is if I do a step change to a system, does it, um, does it come and uh, does it settle to some steady state, let's say, okay? So um, what was I gonna show here? So if we're talking about a closed loop system, the inputs of interest here are gonna be the set point and the disturbance, right? So we're not talking, at this point, we're not interested in whether the process itself is stable, because we already know how to do that. We're interested whether the closed loop is stable, okay? So by inputs here, I, let's say I mean, for example, the set point. So I do a step change in the set point, I want the output of the system to be um, bounded, okay? All right, so we already know about open loop stability, which I just drew up on the board, right? So you get the transfer function, you find the denominator polynomial, you factor it. Those are called the poles. They're the same as the eigenvalues of the original differential equations from which the transfer function was derived. And if all those things have negative real part, the system is stable. If even one of them has positive real part, it, it's unstable, okay? All right, so we know that. Um, I made this little point and drew this little picture, or threw this little picture in. Integrating systems are inherently unstable. Okay, what's a typical integrating system? A storage tank, right? Because the idea here is that if you have these two flows balanced, the level will be balanced, right? If you do a step change in this particular uh, flow, right, such that this flow exceeds that flow, this level is going to go up forever. That's not stable, right? Because I told you a bounded input. Step change is bounded, should produce a bounded output. So integrating systems are definitely not stable. In the, according to this definition. Okay, so this is the problem we want to solve, okay? Determine the range of controller parameter values for which the closed-loop system is stable. So in other words, I want you to be able to tell me, for an example like, I'm gonna go back, I know you guys hate this. I want you to tell me for an example like this, okay, all values of Kc, for example, that'll make this system stable. Like between this value and this value, system is stable. Above that, not. Below that, not. Okay, that, that's what we're trying to do. That'll limit our search to values of Kc that are in the range that we know is stable, okay? All right, so that's the problem we're trying to solve. And we don't want to solve this by doing what I just did. Get a closed loop transfer function, pick a value of Kc, right? Compute the inverse Laplace transform, plot the response, pick another value of Kc, do it all over again. And we even don't want to do it in Simulink. It would be faster, obviously, but it's still not very systematic, all right? So, this is the basis for it of um, the methods I'm about to show you. So this is our closed-loop transfer function. We're going to keep writing this over and over again. We like to call these transfer functions here, multiplied together, the controller, the valve, the process, the measurement device. We like to call that thing GOL, okay, for open loop. It's kind of unfortunate terminology in a way, but anyway, just think of this is just a definition. Those two four transfer functions multiplied together are called GOL. And so, if you look at this thing, you can see, you're going to be able to write this as a, a, a ratio of two polynomials, right? That's what we did back here, right? I wrote this as the ratio of two polynomials, right? Here's the numerator, here's the denominator, okay? So for any problem we have, you ca I can specify all this information. It gets a little more complicated if you have time delays, well, let's not worry about that right now. But I get, specify all this information, you multiply it out, you get the ratio of two polynomials, you call the thing in the numerator NC for controller and thing in the denominator DC. All right, now, <clears throat> let's say you wanted to um, take the inverse Laplace transform of this thing, okay? So how are you gonna do this? Well, in principle, this is, this is all um, conceptual at this point. What are we gonna do? We're gonna multiply across by the input, right? You're gonna specify some input change, like one over S or M over S or whatever, okay? And then you're going to take the inverse Laplace, um, you're going to want to take the inverse Laplace transform of that. What I've done at this point is assume that you have this thing here, you multiply it by the set point. Uh, this is unfortunate. That should be NC typo. Should be the same thing as up there, NC. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. And now all I'm trying to represent by going from here to here is I'm telling you I've, I've managed to factor this denominator. Okay into its roots, okay? So right, the NC should be C here, just comes down. The S there comes from the set point change, which I assume is something like one over S. And then this thing here represents the factored version of that thing there, okay? 
So we have these roots here of the denominator, right? They're called the poles. These things are called the closed loop poles. The things we talked about before over here, these things are the open loop poles, okay? So these are the poles of the closed loop system. And it, once you got it in this form, you know that if you were to take the inverse Laplace transform, it would have this form right here, okay? So you don't know what these coefficients a's are. We often call those things alphas because you'd have to do, you know, partial fraction expansion potentially, but, um, but you know that you're going to get terms that look like this. So from this S term, you're going to just get a constant. From this term right here, you're going to get some constant. You don't know what it is, but it's going to be e to whatever P1t is, okay? P1 could be a real number, could be an imaginary number, could be a complex, you don't know at this point, okay? So uh, the point is that each one of these terms in this factor denominator are going to spawn a term in the inverse Laplace transform, that from the step change that from that root, so on and so forth, okay? All right, so if you look at this thing, you can see that these P's probably have a lot to do with whether the system is stable, right? So it's the same thing we did in the open loop case, which I'll show you a little bit more in the next slide, okay? But just think of the simplest case, is if these things are real numbers, they better, these P's better be negative, right? Because if, if this is like E to the minus 2T, that'll decay. If this is E to minus 5T, that'll decay. If this thing is E to the plus 2T, you're, it's, you're, it's all over for you or for your system, okay? Because this term's going to explode, system's not stable, okay? So at this point, you should, you should get a pretty good idea that, hey, I, what we're going to be doing here is finding this denominator, factoring it, checking the roots, and seeing if the real parts are, are negative, just like we did before, okay? The problem with doing this in general is that this polynomial is usually going to depend on the parameters of the controller, okay? Just like that, see? KC there. So you can't actually fact do this factorization until you know KC, which is where the problem comes in, and that's what we're trying to deal with, okay? But anyway, this, this thing here is called the characteristic equation. So the idea here is that you take um, this denominator and write it as 1 plus GOL. So if I say characteristic equation, I mean this equation here, okay? Um, once I get a polynomial for that thing, I call it the characteristic polynomial. So this is the, the equation that we're going to use to determine if the closed-loop system is stable. We're going to form this equation. We're going to um, get a polynomial. We're going to find the roots of the polynomial, and we're going to check if they have negative real part. And that's what it comes down to, okay? Again, the complication here is this polynomial is going to depend on the parameters of the controller. So if you have a proportional only controller, you'll have KC floating around in here. If you have a PI controller, you have KC and tau i floating around in this equation. Okay. And so we have to deal with that because you can't actually factor a polynomial without knowing what KC is, generally speaking. Okay. All right. So this is the general rule here. This is not that useful for checking, but it is something we'll build on. So it says, Basically, feedback control system, which means the system I just showed you, is stable um, if and only if, I'll come back to that, if all the roots of the characteristic equation have negative real part. Just what I said. Take this, form this equation, get a polynomial, check the roots. If they all have negative real part, system is stable. Okay, that's just the same graph I, thing I just drew up there. So you take these closed loop poles, you plot them in this plane. If they're all over here, meaning they all have negative real part, system is stable. If even one of them is over there, system is not stable, okay? All right, so this is the kind of, what I'm doing over here, or the book is doing over here, is showing what type of responses you get for different types of poles, closed loop poles. So the way to think about it, we're plotting just one of these terms, just to show you what each term would look like, depending on the value, what type of root you have for P. So if, if that P is negative and real, then that thing is going to go to zero, right? I mean, like, um, it's going to lead to a, resp they don't actually show this one going to zero, but um, that's because they're actually doing these plots, not in terms of deviation <laughs> variables, perhaps. But the point is that this term is going to decay, and it's not going to be a problem, OK? On the other hand, if the root is, is re just real, but it's positive, this term is going to explode. You're going to get an exponential kind of instability like that. That's going to be a problem. If a complex conjugate pair, if, they're bo if they both have negative real part, you know, because they're complex conjugate, you're going to get an oscillatory solution, but the oscillations will decay, right? Because you'll get something like e to the minus at times some sine function, but if a is positive, the oscillations will decay over time. That's this. On the other hand, if the, the real part's positive, the oscillations will grow, okay? So obviously, we want to avoid that part, you know, uh, that possibility, and we want to avoid this possibility, okay? 
So conceptually, it's, it's not really anything different than we've done before. The problem is, how do you factor this thing if it involves KC or tau i or tau i, tau d, KC? So factorization of the thing may be not so easy, OK? So here's an example where you can do it explicitly. And I'll show you. I'm going to go through this example. I'm going to show you why it, that you generally can't do it this way. All right, so what I've done is I've come up with a simplified problem. This is simpler than the one I showed you on the first slide. So there's my controller. Okay. I think the simplification comes primarily because I say GM is the one. Sorry about this. I'm doing this a lot to you today. Yeah. So I made it simpler by choosing, instead of assuming the measurement device has some dynamics, I assume it's just a gain. That, that's going to reduce the order of the polynomial down here. It's going to make it so I can factor it using quadratic equation. All right. So there we go. So control is proportional. Process transfer function is first order. I'm assuming the valve is first order, but now the measurement device is just a gain. Okay. <laughs> I said, what do you got to do? Well, form this equation, the character's equation, 1 plus GOL. GOL is those four transfer functions multiplied together. Okay? So what's GC? It's just this gain. It's just proportional controller. So it's just KC, GV is um, that thing. GP is that thing. GM is that thing. Put them, multiply them all together, you get that. It's not, it's not rocket science, as they say. All right? Okay, well that's not a very convenient form to work with, so I want to get a, pol you know, a polynomial. I want to get this out of the numerator, so not surprisingly I'll multiply across both sides of the equation by this, and then multiply it out, and then you get that. And this is very simple algebra here, okay? All right, and you can see here, this is the character's equation. You want to check the roots of this to see if the real parts are negative, but it's, it involves KC. So in this case, because you have a quadratic equation, you can plug it in the quadratic formula. Usually, this isn't the case, right? Because, well, if this is third order or higher, this approach isn't going to work. But it's second order, so we can do this. So now I'm going to use the quadratic equation to find the roots of this thing as a function of kc, right? The reason this works because, right, for a second order polynomial, this is an analytical solution for the roots. If it's third order, fourth order, you don't have such an equation. I think there is something like a third order equation, but it's really unruly. All right, so I'm just going to use this equation. So everyone knows the quadratic equation, right? This looks like um, AS a squared plus BS plus C equals 0, right? So it's minus B plus or minus B squared minus 4AC divided by 2A. You remember this famous equation? All right, so there you go. You get this equation. And then you're like, OK, what do you need for this to be? You need these roots to have negative real part. There's two of them. Not surprisingly, quadratic, there's going to be two. All right. So now you want to reason and say, when is this going to have positive, um, negative real part? OK, this is my supposition here. That as long as KC is greater than minus 1, so minus 1, 0, 1, anything above minus 1, this will be OK. OK, how did I figure that out? Well, what I did actually um, was I plugged in the value KC equal minus 1. So if you plug in the value KC equals minus 1, then this term goes to 0, right? This thing becomes the square root of seven, 49, which is 7. Okay. Then you have one of the roots is minus 7 plus 7. That's 0. That's right on the precipice. <laughs> you understand? So that's, that's the case. So what do you want? You want the roots to be negative. So I'm telling you, if k c equals minus 1, one of the poles is right at the origin. Okay. So if k c is slightly greater than minus 1, right, then this thing will be, this term here will be slightly uh, negative, and then minus this will be slightly positive, and therefore this number here will be slightly more than 7 once you take the square root, and minus 7 plus something slightly more than 7 is going to be positive. It just, okay. So okay, so you can look at this and, and you can argue, you might have to look at it a little bit more, um, but since we're not going to generalize this concept, not that critical that you see all the details here, but you can say, OK, if KC is greater than minus 1, these roots are going to be real, and they're going to be both be negative. right? The one you're really concerned about is the minus 7 plus. The minus 7 minus is going to be okay. OK. All right, so that's great. So KC greater than minus 1 will work. Um, first of all, this is not that convenient, because you do have to do this kind of reasoning with this equation. And the other problem is not going to be generalizable to anything that's greater than S, than S squared. So it's not going to work for that one. right? Like for this case, we'd want to check the roots of that thing. It's not going to work out for us. So, all right, so now what do we want to do? Well, so you, 
so the reasoning here is we don't want to compute the inverse. Uh, we don't want to compute the actual response because that involves taking the inverse Laplace transform. So I told you we don't need to compute the response to determine the system is stable. All we have to do is check the roots of this equation, right? But now we've got, now we come to the conclusion we really don't want to check these roots either because we, we we have to find them as a function of the controller parameters, and this could be really hard. So we don't want to actually compute the roots. <laughs> okay, so. There's a, way, there's a couple of ways of getting around this, which I'm about to show you. The first one is this method. Okay? It's a very famous result. Maybe come from the 1940s or something like that. Um, so anyway, I'm just pointing out this out. What is the problem with what I just showed you? That you must explicitly compute the roots in terms of the controller parameters. Generally, you can't do that. You can do it if it's second order, but even if it's second order, then you have to like, look at an equation like this and try to reason like, okay. When is, the, when is it going to have negative real part, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of not very convenient, even if you can do it, and usually you can't anyway. Okay. All right, so the power of this method here, and the, me the other method I'm about to show you, is this allows you to determine controller parameters that make the system stable. You never have to actually find the roots, okay? which makes it very convenient to use. Okay? Um, so it's only applicable to characteristic equations that are polynomials in S. So in other words, you form this equation, it has to be a polynomial in S. Well, you're like, when's it not going to be a polynomial in S? It's not going to be a polynomial in S if you have time delays. Okay. So if you have a time delay in your problem and you want to apply this method, you have to do an approximation of the time delay using one of the methods I showed you. Remember the Padier approximation? That looked something like this. Right, we said this, we did this weeks ago, but I told you this is the first order Padet approximation. If you want to get rid of the time delay, which is an irrational function in terms of a rational function, which is the ratio of two polynomials, you can do so, use this approximation, okay? So I'm just saying for completeness here, if you want to apply this method, you have a time delay, you're going to have to get rid of the time delay in terms of some approximation of the time delay. That's all, okay? All right, so let's see how it works. Okay, so we have some polynomial here. So this is our characteristic equation. So you understand we've we formed the one plus G O L S equals zero. Did the algebra, approximated the time delay if we had one. We ended up with a polynomial. Okay. I'm telling you, this is the polynomial the polynomial looks something like this. Okay. So I'm saying it's an nth order polynomial. N depends on the nature of the problem you're working on. For the first problem we worked on, N was 3. For the second problem we worked on, N was 2. But N can be any order you want. Okay. Um, these A coefficients depend on the parameters of the controller. You understand? Some of these A's will depend, for example, on KC. It's just not shown here. Okay. So it's not just a it's not just an equation where these a's are all constant. Some of these a's depend in, in, on the KC itself. So if we go back, well, I think I can go forward, actually, when I illustrate this, that I'm just all over the place. OK, so you see, here's an example of an equation that I'll solve in a minute. You can see that, OK, that's what I called a3, a2, a1, but a0 depends on KC. Okay. So some of the parameters, it doesn't matter which ones for what I'm about to tell you, depend on the controller parameters. OK. All right. So this is the way we do the test. Okay, We're trying to test whether this is stable.